Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today I am here to discuss some, uh, how shall we say, flaws of the series, which, yes, gasp, do indeed exist in One Piece, and they generally come to us in the form of storytelling inconsistencies. The first of which to address is the grand inconsistency of you not being subscribed to the Grand Line Review, which, if you were, would grant you regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed, so let's rectify that little inconsistency right here and now. Push the button, I believe in you. But onwards with some trickier things to fix, I do need to say first and foremost that One Piece is a pretty crazily tight piece of media, especially for a series that has been running as long as it has. And I think a lot of that can be credited to the fact that it does have a single author, so it doesn't suffer from multiple writers forgetting each other's established work as Western comics are prone to. But even in the world of manga with lone authors, narrative inconsistencies do tend to appear quite commonly. And yes, that does include One Piece. Although I will say that I did have to travel pretty far far and wide to find them. And I should also make clear that this video is going to be focused exclusively on inconsistencies generated by Echiro Oda himself, which means that we will not be examining any of the really weird stuff that has resulted from the anime adaptation. And some of that is, well, it's pretty strange, probably even worthy of its own video. But for now, we have plenty to discuss with just our core product. And the final thing of note here before we jump into it is that this video will not be focusing on the arguable inconsistencies of Oda narratively resurrecting his characters after giving them death scenes. Primarily because I already have a whole video covering that topic, but also because apart from cases like Pell, for example, there is almost always room for plausibility, which while admittedly still annoying, does not an inconsistency make. So what is inconsistent then? Well, let's start with a very basic and well-known example, which would be Sanji's devil fruit knowledge. And to explain this, we first need to cast our minds back all the way to Baratier, to the moment where Luffy gloriously defeated Don Krieg and then promptly fell into the sea and almost drowned to death. And while Zeph and Sanji are having a semi-profound discussion about spirit and all of that, Zeph casually drops in the line that, hey, Luffy can't swim. In fact, he actually details the lack of ability by saying, the sea hates those those with the powers of the devil fruit. They sink like anchors. To which Sanji, in absolute shock, yells that the old geezer should have told him sooner and then promptly jumps into the water, saves Luffy's life, and the rest is history. A really great touching moment and one of a very long list of reasons why Baratier is such a heavily underrated arc. However, what it also does is establishes Sanji's overall lack of knowledge regarding devil fruits in general, which is pretty awkward when we do eventually come to Thriller Bark and more specifically Sanji's confrontation with Absalom, which is very, very interesting because Sanji was almost immediately able to dissect the fact that Absalom was using the Suke Suke Numi, a paramecia type fruit that allows its user to become invisible. And I'm now going to read you Sanji's quote from the manga, but I want you to keep in mind that back during Baratie, he was unaware of the fact that devil fruit users cannot swim. And with that in mind, Sanji says here, that's right, you've stolen one of my dreams. I know about everything that you can do. When I was a kid, I read through the encyclopedia of devil fruits. I wasn't that interested in them because they didn't seem real and each power comes with a curse, but there was still one entry that struck awe into my heart. If I were able sometime in my life to gain this power, even if it cursed me, I'd still want to eat that fruit. Of course, referring to the Suke Suke no Mi. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of inconsistency. Here, Sanji quite blatantly says that he knows everything about this particular fruit, as well as the fact that devil fruits in general come with a curse. The only kind of plausible deniability at play comes in two forms. Either this extensive devil fruit encyclopedia that was written with detailed powers in mind did not mention that fruit users become unable to swim, or that Sanji had such tunnel vision that he simply did not read it. Both of which are a pretty huge leap of logic, and while not impossible, I suppose, this is almost certainly one of the very rare examples of Oda being inconsistent. And next up, let's take a more recent example, well, relatively recent anyway, and still devil fruit related actually, because we now move all the way to Whole Cake Island, and we land on a certain Charlotte Katakuri, a man who has one of the most curious devil fruits in the series being the Mochi Mochi you know me, an existence that still greatly confuses more casual fans to this day. And to be perfectly frank, that confusion is Oda's fault. And this is because in the original release of chapter 863 in Weekly Shonen Jump, when Jinbei is explaining the Mochi Mochi no Mi, he refers to it as a Logia type, which when reading it weekly, yeah, that was fine. I mean, no Mochi was not an element in the same way that the other Logias are, but Katakuri's abilities to this point were consistent with that of any other Logia user. However, this definition would go on to drastically, drastically change 
change with the Japanese release of volume 86, which contained the chapter in question. Now, volume releases are considered to be the final product of the manga, and they get used to fix up various mistakes, which are usually minor artistic mishaps. You know, stuff like putting Zoro's scar on the wrong side of his face and all that. Nothing big, usually anyway. This is an exception, because in this volume release, Jinbei's description of the Mochi Mochi no Mi went from being a Logia to a special Paramecia. Now, we can speculate as to why this change was made, but it is a fairly blatant inconsistency, especially if you were reading weekly at the time, but even in retrospect, it still seems a bit weird. And this is because if you do look back on early Katakuri, he was portrayed as a raw Logia user, even with Jinbei's edited classification in mind. And that's because that was more than likely what he was intended to be. So it's hard to blame fans who get confused by this because his demonstrated power evokes that of a Logia in every way. And as for why it was changed, one possibility is that Oda realized his inconsistency with the idea of Logias being elements, but the more interesting thought is that Oda changed his mind halfway through because the Katakuri character went on to evolve somewhat. And as Oda delved more and more into the future sight aspect of Katakuri, he may simply have thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool if Katakuri could use this power to make himself seem like a Logia user? Either way, there was still a problem though, because even with future sight in mind, the Mochi Mochi no Mi was inconsistent with established Paramecias. And that's because the Mochi Mochi no Mi inhabits multiple characteristics of this class, whereas standard Paramecias are restricted to one. And so as a result, we have landed on the classification of special Paramecia, a type of devil fruit which still has yet to be officially defined, as well as a type that we can say with all certainty, spawned entirely from narrative inconsistency. Third up now, and let's get into one that I mention a fair bit in my videos, and I'm sorry for going over it again for all of you longtime viewers, but it is really difficult to do a topic like this without mentioning the infamous five flying types. And this one spawns from the Alabaster arc when Pell came to the rescue of Princess Vivi and proudly declared to his miscellaneous enemies that, quote, you are lucky to see this. Only five flying devil fruits are known to exist. And he was of course referring to his own devil fruit as part of that five, which the Viz translation as rather adorably called the Tweet Tweet Fruit Model Falcon, although it may be the least intimidating name I've ever heard, especially when trying to make bold statements like this, but hey, that's not the point. The point is that Pell and by association Oda are trying to make a statement here regarding the existence of devil fruits that grant their user the ability to fly. A statement which in retrospect looks slightly ridiculous because there are so many devil fruits that grant flight at this stage that I usually actually forget a whole ton of them when trying to prove this point, but we're gonna give it another go. So in addition to Pell's Tori Tori no Mimo, of Falcon, we also have Marco's Mythical Phoenix Fruit, King's Ancient Pteranodon Fruit, also Big News Morgans, who was confirmed in the Vivia Card data book to be the user of a mythical Zoan that turns him into an albatross, the two bug Zoans amongst the Tontata tribe, both of whom could access natural flight, as well as Kaido's currently unnamed Devil Fruit, which unless Kaido's true form is a dragon, is also a flight granter. So that's seven fruits already, and we've only really explored the Zoan class. If we dip into Paramecias, we can also identify Shiki's Fuafu no Mi, the primary benefit of which is generally a floating flight, Buffalo's Guru Guru no Mi, which is 100% focused on flight, given that it literally turns its user's body into propellers, Verona's Horo Horo no Mi, because for unexplained reason, she can also use that to fly in a similar manner to which Shiki can, and then you hit the Logia class and things go pretty berserk, because almost every Logia in the series is capable of achieving flight through the basic mechanism of elemental propulsion. Not all of them, but most of them. And that's all before we delve into grand speculation like, say, Lafitte, for example, who would appear to be a potential Zoan user that can fly. So by this stage, uh, look, I've honestly lost count, but I think we're looking at a couple more than five. And look, there is the boring in-world explanation for this, which is simply that at the time Pell said this, there were only five recorded flying devil fruits in the world, which I have to guess would obviously be his, Marco's, Big News Morgan's, Kaido, and King, just based on the sheer prominence of these individuals. But we also do need to be real here and look at this from a more meta perspective. One Piece is a story after all, not a reality show or a documentary. And the purpose of this scene was clearly to convey this information to the audience, not the miscellaneous characters of the world who we never saw again. This is Oda saying to us through the Vessel of Pell that at this stage in the story, he intended for there only to be five devil fruits that allowed flight. Now, whether he intended that to be constrained to the Zoan class is a different discussion, but it doesn't matter. Because even if that were the case, as One Piece continued, Oda has changed his mind about this very boldly declared fact in the days of Alabaster. And as such, the five flying types have become one of the greater inconsistencies within the series. And the next element I'd like to explore in this 
video is the general inconsistency that Haki rather unfortunately introduced into One Piece. So despite this idea being retrospectively introduced in chapter one with Shanks' interaction with the Lord of the Coast, Haki was a very late game addition to One Piece, with its features being more consciously implemented beginning with the initial Sabadia, but actually not being explained until almost 600 chapters into the series by Ray Lee just prior to the time skip. And look, when you're introducing a new feature like this after close to 600 chapters and claiming that it had always been a part of this world, then you are bound to run into a few inconsistencies with said implementation. I mean, yes, to some degree, Haki is fine and clearly planned. Like we have another example when Shanks confronted Whitebeard and a whole host of pirates fainted at his very presence, clearly growing the seed that is Conqueror's Haki. It's more when things get to observation and armament that things get a bit more questionable. And in reality, it brings up an awful lot of retrospective discrepancies that can't really be helped honestly, because Oda never quite intended One Piece to run this long, but characters like Crocodile would be a good example. In his position as a warlord of the sea, it is very difficult to swallow either the idea that he did not possess Haki himself or chose not to use it during his battle with Luffy on Alabasta. It's just one of those things where given how extraordinarily important Haki is, the idea of Crocodile not having it becomes incredibly questionable. Although an even better example would be Rob Lucci and in fact the rest of CP9. These guys were the superhuman agency of the world government who had spent their lives mastering the Rokushiki. But to think that the world government did not offer them any instruction on the art of Haki is pretty absurd, especially when you consider that Haki isn't exactly a hidden aspect amongst the world government or the Marines. I mean, anybody in a vice admiral position needs to know it by default and many of the lower ranking soldiers acquire it as well. So it would seem that not teaching CP9 Haki would be criminal negligence on the part of the world government because knowing even one brand, observation, armament, or if you're lucky enough conquerors, take your pick, whatever, but it would provide you with infinitely more powerful and resourceful agents to do your bidding. And stuff like this can be found everywhere in the pre-Haki era, which I want to emphasize is not a mistake made by Oda, but it is the reality of having an unintentionally long running series like One Piece. Eventually, newer ideas are going to contradict previous ones, and less well thought out ideas implemented very early on in the series can become skewed and complicated, leading us to the wonderful land of inconsistency later on. With that said, I will completely own up to the idea that this entire video is quite nitpicky, which I think only speaks to how great of a series One Piece is. The fact that we can go this long and only end up with a mere handful of inconsistencies, none of which is story breaking by the way, is simply amazing. Oda has done pretty damn well in this regard, and it is one of the many, 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 many reasons why One Piece has been as absurdly successful as it is. But what do you guys think? Please do leave your thoughts down in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, then please do go and check out some of my other content or even subscribe to the channel for more glorious One Piece business uploaded straight into your YouTube feeds. But for now, this has been the Grand Line Review and I'll see you next time.